Hey guys, uh, in this video we're going to be talking about some of the operators that we're going to be applying to functions and what the result of these operators gives us. So let's assume we have two functions f and g. f maps a set A to set B and g maps a set C to set D. And these two sets over here are, are not related to the, these sets over here. Okay, so let's try the first operator. The first operator is basically going to add these two functions up separately. So if you're trying to find the addition of functions, a new function that basically adds f and g, then that will be equal to the individual functions being added. The second rule is for the subtraction of these two functions. That's obtained when we subtract the two functions individually. These two rules are pretty simple to understand if you think about it. The third rule is the product of the functions. So we're basically multiplying two functions together, f and g, and then we're plugging in a value x. The new function would be equal to f of x times g of x. And the final function that we're going to talk about well, actually, the second last. There's one more important function that comes after that, but that's very specific. This would be the division operator on a value x. This would be equal to f of x divided by g of x. But we need to put a certain condition over here such that the denominator is never 0, which means the function g of x will never attain the value 0. Okay? So now we'll be talking about the fifth category. That's basically the composition of these functions. So before even starting, I'll just tell you guys the result for this, which basically turns out to be this. Interpreting this is not too hard if you think about it. What's happening over here is g is a function that's mapping elements of a to elements of b. And you're getting a particular value over here that corresponds to g of x. But f is taking the elements that you're getting in the range of g and is mapping them on to c which is precisely what you see over there so i'll try to explain this fact using diagrams we have a set a and we have a set b the elements are corresponding to the mapping and the idea is that a is supposed to be the domain of g as specified over here and uh, b will correspond to the range of g. But there's something different going on over here. The range that you're getting in this function has to be the domain of f for this to work. Because the domain, but because the range, because the value that you're getting in g of x, it corresponds to the value in b. Because that's what it is, right? If I had a function g of x over here, I could write it as x squared. But if I plug in a particular value of x, I get the value of y, or in this case, the value of g. And now this value is going to act as the domain of f because it's being inserted inside the function. So basically what I'm saying is the range of g has to be the domain of f. Therefore, a third set 3 will talk about the mapping of all the elements of b to the elements of c. And this would now correspond to the range of f. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the concept of the composition of functions. Let's do a particular example to illustrate the concept that we've just studied. Let's make up a function f of x. Let's call it sine x squared. So which can basically be written as sine squared x. And we have another function g of x. That's basically a linear function, 4x plus 7. Let's try to find f composed with g of x. This would turn out to be the same as f of g of x, which means before even plugging anything for f, we need to know what g of x is. Since g of x corresponds to 4x plus 7, in the domain of f will reside 4x plus 7. Because 4x plus 7 is basically giving us the range of g, which coincidentally turns out to be the domain of f. Since we know that f of x equals sine squared x, 
All we're going to do now is plug in the value of x instead of the value of x that's over here. So f of 4x plus 7 will be inserted where x is over here. So this would turn out to be sine of 4x plus 7 whole squared. What if we were to do it the other way around? g of f of x. Let's do the same procedure. In this case, f of x will have to be plugged in the domain of g, right? Since we know that f of x is equal to sine squared x, now we know what to do with this function. Since we know g of x is equal to 4x plus 7, g of sine squared x is going to be simply 4 times the domain, which is sine squared x, or the range actually. That's the range of f in this case. So it's going to be 4 times sine squared of x plus 7. This would give us the function, which illustrates a very important fact. The g of f of x is not necessarily equal to f of g of x, which is a very important idea. Okay, so now I'd like to explain to you guys the relation between a, the composition of functions and an inverse function. So let's assume that we have a function f that takes values from a and maps them to values of b. And the inverse, obviously, for this would be a function that takes b and maps it back to a, right? That's a definition of function, an inverse function, actually. And the conditions that would have to be satisfied would be that the function has to be onto and it has to be one to one, right? So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to draw a over here and b over here. Elements are being mapped to elements in b, right? And f is basically doing this, but f inverse is doing the exact opposite to this, right? So something like that, that, and uh, that. A confusing diagram. But you guys get the idea. F inverse is taking elements from B, mapping them back to A, and F is doing the exact opposite. It's taking elements in A and mapping them to B. Now what I want to do is, I want to try to find F composed with F inverse for a particular element, and F inverse composed with F inverse. I want to see if they're equal to each other. So for that, first, I'm going to have to assume that I have an element A that belongs to A, right? The first set over here. And then I have an element B that belongs to B. So I want to see if these two results hold for each other. And what we know for a fact is that A is being mapped on to B over here, right? And uh, we're going to do this with respect to an element X, but we're going to have to define what that element X is. So X is basically the input that's going inside the composition of these two functions, right? So let's do that. Since we know that this can be rewritten as this equation, which basically tells us something that we're using f inverse of x first, and whatever result we get, we're going to plug it in the function x. So when we're using f inverse of x, we're basically taking a value b, and we're plug it, plugging it inside, right? Once we do that, we're going to get a value a, because f inverse is taking elements in b and mapping them to a, right? So we're going to get f of a. And if we think about it, f of a is simply b, because it's taking a, the function f, it's taking a and it's mapping it onto b. So according to this map that you see over here, a is being mapped to b, right in this function. So even before that, let's try to work out the other result. You know, we know we can rearrange this as f inverse of f of x, right? But we know that x over here is going to correspond to a since we're using f of x before anything else. That's going to be f of a. But we know that f of a is equal to b because a is being mapped to b in the function f, right? But now we're going to be using b. But the function this time, it's going to be f of inverse. So f of inverse is taking in b and it's mapping it to a, which means the answer is a. A very interesting thing that you guys can notice at this point is that whatever we're plugging in the very beginning of the fun function, for example, over here, we were plugging in b, right? because f inverse is being used first, then we're getting b. So the composition of a function and its inverse is equal to the input, or in this case, x. And this result would hold for the reverse order as well.
since we can see it highlighted above. And that's basically it for this video. In the next video, we're going to be ending this short introduction to functions and sets by talking about drawing basic graphs and what happens when we try to shift the graph in the x-axis and the y-axis and if we multiply it by a particular scalar. See you guys in the next video.